please compare for us <laughs> the philosophies of the two greatest physicists there ever were. Okay, so Who I'm, you, you said this. So I was going to say, <laughs> so he's talking. So one of them has got to be Isaac Newton. Yeah, That's got to be I, I, one. Newton and Einstein. So, and then, so yeah. tell me. Good. Because you clearly you studied this because you're writing about the man and everything. Yeah. So and I love the fact that we share sort of uh, access to history. Yeah. And what that means yeah. in the present. Yeah. So I just want to know how would you characterize Newton's philosophy relative to Einstein's philosophy? And I have he hang on. Before I earned enough money to buy an actual book from Isaac Newton's days, I got this paperback called Newton's Philosophy of yeah. Nature. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. A little paperback. Uh -huh. Selections from his and writings. So, and it's, it's, it's not only from his great books, but also his writings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. May I? No. Oh, oh. that's just a paperback. <laughs> yeah, I thought. I, I, I was it's thinking not of, your original. I don't know. I thought it's my yeah, original. It's not your He's original. He's holding it like it's a teddy bear or something. <laughs> <laughs> this means something to you. Yeah, but see, I've been, you. Yeah, right. see, been see, all up in it. You've been up in it. you got every, all the pages of dog I've had this since middle of high school. Wow. So me and Newton go back. And don't you badmouth Newton in, in no, this No, I'm not going to badmouth Newton. I love Newton. <laughs> Good. I, he's a primary source in my philosophy of space and time class. Because students... That's a class you take. It I is. I want to take that class. I would love to have you. I'm I, teaching it in the fall. Okay. Also, Einstein as philosopher is a course I'm teaching in the fall. Got it. Anyway, Newton was motivated at least in developing, by many things, but in developing in particular his theory of gravitation in an essay called De Gravitatione. I don't know how to pronounce the Latin, but there it is. He's responding to Descartes, who had three laws of motion. But Descartes thought that all motion was relative. And so it is in developing his response to Newton, uh, to Descartes' theory of motion, entirely on philosophical grounds. He is reasoning from his armchair how he can understand motion. He must have had a ways. badass armchair. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. He did. He chair. also invented the calculus yes. <laughs> from that same armchair. Einstein is responding to Newton. He was bothered by the fact that in a fully physical worldview that Newton said he was presenting, you nevertheless had a background space-time that was not, that was influencing matter, but not itself able to be influenced by matter. This asymmetry of dynamics bothered him. So what, let me restate what I wow. think you said, that Newton that is describing a universe embedded within space and time. Sort of a theater, yeah, background yes, it, in which it's matter- a, a theater set. Yeah, yes, okay. Right. And so, whereas Einstein wanted the theater set and the players in the theater to interact with, with yeah, that's one right. another. That's right. And in particular, Newtonian mass is inertial mass. It's, it's an intrinsic, in the old school philosophy tradition, it is a property that belongs to the thing in virtue of the thing itself. This mass. Also, mass. Yeah, just remind people, you know, Weight Watchers is really Mass Watchers. Right. <laughs> if you want to wait, let's just go to the moon. Yeah, go to the moon. <laughs> there you go. Nice. Thanks, Oprah. <laughs> There's a lot of ways to weigh less. And right. So, but how do you get the money to go to the moon in the first place? But <laughs> so, yeah. No, I just want to just clear. So when, you're remo when you reduce your number of fat cells in your body, giving it up to energy, mm -hmm. uh, then you're reducing, it's a mass you're, you're yeah. cutting from yourself. It's supposed to be some deep, essential, probably meaning essence of the thing. Mm -hmm. This also bothered Einstein. He didn't think that things should have innate properties in this way. Wow. And so one of the things that motivated him going from special to general relativity was a paper he wrote in 1913 where he predicts gravitational waves, by the way. So he didn't want mass to be something that just belonged because God decreed it thus. Uh, and so he developed, a, a, he developed a way of accounting for mass that was also dynamical. We give something inertial mass because it's following a geodesic. It's following a particular path through space-time. And that is why we call something having inertial mass. It is so not an intrinsic uh, clear, feature of a, a the A geodesic on Earth is a path that you would take where if you sliced through that path, your slice goes through the center of the Earth. Mm -hmm. So it turns out if you do the math, it's the shortest distance. The between shortest distance, that's right. So that's why you see on a map, uh, you see these loop, the, yeah, the loops plane map, back and forth. they right. have arcs. Right. If you made that a sphere, that would be a, the shortest. It's, we call that a geodesic, meaning Earth, but now you're taking it and using it for the whole right. universe. Because another thing he was doing in this 1911, in these papers when he's developing what's called the entorf, like the in-between theory between general and special relativity. He's working toward general relativity, uh -huh. publishing along the way. 
Um, and he's realizing that the effects due to acceleration are the same as the effects due to gravity. So acceleration and gravity are like two sides of the same coin. So I, even, every this time I bananas, hear it, I'm right? like, this brilliant. is so brilliant. It's, it's, it's so it's awesome. It's simple it's and totally, brilliant. But he was motivated by Newton's account not answering his why questions. This asymmetry between like space and time being this God-ordained theater in which things happened, but the things themselves couldn't affect space-time was a principal motivation for his wanting to dig deeper and come up with a theory of space and time and gravitation that didn't sort of, wasn't ordained on high. Didn't but sort he of, apologize to Newton? I have no idea. Somebody, Did Einstein apologize to Newton? I, I, Perhaps in jest. I, I have a memory because his, his whole understand, his general theory of relativity supplants Newton's gravity. That's and right. I think yeah. oh. he apologized at some point. Like, well, it's got to be one of those sorry, not sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, is it like the way you apologize to Pluto? <laughs> <laughs> it was like you could also apologize to somebody while saying, but I did a better job, right? right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. he's yeah. still clearly Sorry for blowing you out of the water. <laughs> <laughs> it was okay. like, you have, but also, you know, we're building on the people who came before us right. in developing our viewpoints of the world. Mm -hmm. So he owed a great deal to Newton. So this but started with Descartes. Is what you're saying. Descartes himself took three laws of new, um, motion from Kep like it, well, Kepler's. Uh, Kepler's this, three laws. This thing had this game had been going on for a, for while. a while. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. From a philosophical standpoint, all of these are philosophies. If you mean it in the sense that they're trying to ask the deeper questions yeah, of why do the things that I observe behave I the way you. they do? We come out of Newton. We go through Einstein, uh -huh. and there's, these are still they still make sense even if they're weird. You can still see why they make sense mathematically. But you go into the 1920s mm. and then quantum physics descends and nothing makes sense. But it works. It works. You can make <laughs> predictions. The understanding of the periodic table of elements, of molecules, of atoms, all clicks into place and everybody's scratching their head. So what does a philosopher do then? These are the questions that keep you awake at night. I mean, there was an old quantum theory that Bohr and Zomerfeld, who was a physicist in Munich, had been working on in the 1910s to account for atomic spectra. But they they were trying to understand these empirical data, right? The, the spectrum. By the way, every one of these people got a Nobel Prize. Oh, yeah. Every one of them down the list. Einstein's Nobel Prize was not for relativity. It I know. It was for the photoelectric effect, which yeah. was dealing with quantum and Brownian motion. And yeah. Brownian motion. Yes, yeah. that's right. Brownian motion, which is to do with uh, getting macroscopic about quantum effects. Wow. Um, but yeah. Uh, so Brownian motion, you, you suspend a particle. Like a pollen get, grain, like you, pollen. It's, yeah, you put it in a, in a fluid uh -huh. and it just bounces around. Yeah. And that wasn't fully understood. Like what's going on? Right. It looks like it's random motion. Right, yeah. right. And then you have to calculate there's particles hitting it. Right. That are, that are smaller than it that are hitting it. And you realize there are more molecules of water in a glass of water than there are glasses of water in all the world's oceans. And we didn't have insight into that until Einstein explained Brownian motion to understand what the hell is going on in there. Yeah, we don't know inside, like the insides of atoms yeah. very much yet. Like yeah. there's so right. little known about the structure of atoms. And so that's partly what they're debating. And part of what allowed um, Heisenberg and Pauli and some of the people working at the forefront in the 1920s, they were looking at these descriptions. You remember Bohr's planetary model of the yeah. of the atom, right? It, like it's part of why we call them orbitals. Right. Yeah, because I mean, right. yeah, he made it look like. Right. Yeah, but know. there are huge mysteries with this model. It doesn't account for all the all the spectrum spectrum the data of the spectra they're seeing. Mm -hmm. I'm using all the right Latin plurals here. I hope, but also how is it that it jumps from one energy? level to the to next, next and it does it discreetly that's right, right. it does it quantum like there's no actual physical motion from one place to the what other what does the philosopher say about this yeah well they were boring Zomerfeld you have explained theory. you've been here sitting here for half hour I'm about you have to not deliver <laughs> <laughs> the, the coup de grace <laughs> if you would shut up okay right. okay go all due respect, all right, sir. finish sir. him yeah okay. they were trying to describe the electrons using classical terms for particles position momentum 
Heisenberg said, what if we use totally different things to describe the electron? What if we try to write down instead of equations of motion in this classical way, we, we think about the electron in terms of way, like by writing down the intensity, by writing down the amplitude. Like a, like a wave. Yeah, sort of. But he didn't use quite that language, but he said, let's look, he used what's called Fourier, like F-O-U-R-I-E-R, another French term, Fourier, analysis to look at it, and he got these equations out that worked, and it was only by sort of stepping back and saying the language we're using is presenting to us a world that is a classical world. That's a world. philosophical pivot. It was a, new, it was a new approach. It was a new lens for looking at the problem. It was a new lens for attacking right, the problem. Right, because if you, if you believe or you think that these other metrics are what actually matter, and if they don't actually matter, you're gonna get the wrong answer. Mm -hmm. And Schrodinger continued to argue, like he developed wave mechanics in 26. Heisenberg did this 20, in 1925. Uh, in 1926, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. so right on the heels of this, Schrodinger gives a description in terms of waves, and everybody knew, wa we love waves, we see waves everywhere, sound waves, water waves, we understand how waves behave at the macroscopic level, and so when Schrodinger gave a version of quantum mechanics that was all written down in terms of waves, People said, I can visualize that. I can understand how to model that. But right. it didn't quite do all the things Heisenberg's matrix mechanics did. But they were arguing about these viewpoints in a philosophical way. Like, what, it, what do we need when we have a full scientific theory? Do we need to be able to visualize in space and time what's going on? Or do we need the right equation? <laughs> Thank you.